Good morning. Just a few announcements. Hopefully you got picked up a bulletin with the insert in it, which we'll sing in our last hymn this morning. This insert comes from our, our old hymn book, and it's public domain, so it, there's no issue with uh, copying it and placing it in our um, insert this morning. Uh, the Antunes are having their second baby this summer, so they have announced that. Read about their prayer requests there in the bulletin. Uh, Martin, of course, is uh, talking to a lot of students who have substantial challenges. As you can imagine, uh, the, the uh, students coming into uh, college age years uh, in Savannah and SCAD are dealing with a lot of um, distressing issues and Martin he's um, counseling them and talking to them so be, be in prayer for that but uh, praise God for the work that he's doing there at SCAD and through Martin and Tune. Uh, come back this evening we'll join together Petros aren't here today they've got a, a, a guest this weekend and um, it's good to have the Folkers back where'd they go? <laughs> they they must be uh, worshiping with family or, or something their, like. Their granddaughter is being confirmed in the Methodist church. Uh, gotcha, gotcha. All right, all right. Well, we're glad to have everybody, and, and it was good to visit with them in Sunday school. I'll turn it over to Greg. Uh, good morning. As the, uh, the the rain washes clean the pollen. Uh, and uh, the Lord washes clean our hearts. Thank goodness for both. Uh, if you'll take your, ins your bulletin and turn with me, let's stand and we will have our responsive reading to the call to worship <clears throat> in your bulletins. Hear the word of God. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Amen. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord, we, we come this morning with joy, Lord, giving thanks. Lord, to enter your courts with this thanksgiving. Father, we long to praise our God, Lord, even with the gladness you have given us because of Christ. Lord, we thank you. You have made us the sheep of your pasture, and we gladly follow you. So, Lord, we ask your presence in this service as we come through Jesus' name. Amen. We begin with hymn 528, Rejoice, You Pure in Heart. <clears throat> Rejoice, ye pure in heart. Rejoice, give thanks and see. Rejoice, give thanks and 
seated. The affirmation of faith is the Nicene Creed, page 852. <clears throat> Pointing to the scriptures, we ask, Christian, what has God shown us? We must believe in his word. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, whom for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our Old Testament is Isaiah 53. As we begin moving closer to Easter, to get our minds in tune, Isaiah 53, it is that prophecy that's foretelling the life and the atonement and the sacrifice of Jesus. And it points to our sermon in Mark 10. And what the disciples of Jesus sort of keep failing to, uh, to understand. Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed." 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He, was put, he has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the, the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Amen. The word of God. Let's turn our hearts toward a time of silent confession. O oh Lord, against you and you alone have we sinned. We confess these sins. In Jesus' name, amen. The assurance of pardon is uh, found in Colossians 2. It's verses 13 through 15. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having counseled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through the cross. Uh, Would you, we going to, uh, I guess, I think the last time that I led an intercessor prayer, I, it, I was, it seemed like I kind of had a theme, and it was the faithfulness of the Lord. And it seems like that in preparing for this, 
the theme is the presence of the Lord. Uh, and if you look at Psalm, um, yeah, Psalm 42, uh, verse 5, it, but it's repeated. There's some stanzas repeating. And it says, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you restless within me? And it says, Wait for the Lord, or hope in the Lord. For I will again praise him for the help of his presence. In other words, we want help, and I do, and we all do, but we realize the main help, the first help, is the presence of the Lord. And uh, so, would you join me as we pray in intercessory prayer? Lord, I, I do thank you for your presence. I thank you, Lord, uh, as your word speaks of your presence. And in the book of Isaiah, it says, But now, thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow with you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will make those words live in each of our hearts this day. And Lord, I pray for those that are here that are lonely, that are, whether you're struggling spiritually, physically, uh, struggling with pain. Dear Lord, there's pain in our lives. Uh, but I pray that your presence will be our help. That uh, nothing will come between that. Uh, the truth of your word, the truth of your promise. Uh, we praise you for that, O oh Lord. And Father, I, I thank you for the hope we have. And your word says that hope does not disappoint us because the Holy Spirit has poured out the love of God, the love of Christ in our hearts. Open the eyes of our heart to that, Lord, to the reality of that. I pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us to feed on your faithfulness, as the psalmist said. Nourishment, just like you provide food for our bodies, nourish our souls with your faithfulness and the truths of that. Lord, I thank you for Greg. I pray for him as he delivers your words. May they be your words. Apply them to our heart to convict us to teach us, to correct us, and to train us, Lord, in gospel righteousness. Father, as individual prayer request, I pray for this congregation, your body here, Lord Jesus, during this time. Redeem this time. It's not a time that we stand still. 
but redeem this time that we may know you better, trust you more. Father, uh, this is time that you have provided. There's a reason. Uh, guide us, Lord. I pray for the search committee as they search. Uh, direct them. Thank you for them. Lord, I thank you for uh, Tyler and Clark uh, leading and guiding. Uh, I pray you will encourage and guide them, Father. Lord, I pray for the, our leaders in, at this time. And Father, it, these are difficult times. I mean, it's just upside down world right now. But Lord, we pray to you in your sovereignty. In your truth, I pray, Lord, guide us as your people who are called by your name to go forth full of truth and grace. We can't do that on our own. We acknowledge that. Uh, and Lord, I pray that you will have mercy on our leaders. Uh, they, many of them certainly don't appear to know you and follow you. But Lord, if it's your will, I pray you will have mercy and save them. Uh, I pray, Lord, that, uh, that laws can be changed. Laws, there are so many unjust laws. Uh, and, but Lord, more than laws being changed, I pray that hearts will be changed to give you glory. And Lord, forgive us as your people for, for trusting politicians more than we trust you. We need to be involved, but may nothing come between our trust for you and your will and your truth. Lord, I pray for the, uh, there are many individual needs here. Uh, I pray for, uh, Pray for the Hopper family. I pray for Nell and Rick as they are taking care of their mom. We pray for her. Uh, we thank you for the uh, for the new member of the family that's coming, for Will and his wife, for the baby. I pray for a healthy delivery this Wednesday. May that family be encouraged, dear Lord. New life. Uh, they've dealt with a lot. I pray for Bill as he is uh, they trying to decide what type of procedure they can do. Guide those surgeons and the people who are running those tests. I pray for Suzanne, Father, as she'll have her pre-op this week. Uh, that, that will go well. Thank you, Lord, for the doctors that you provide for all of us, for the skills. And we, we lift these up. Lord, I pray for Deb as she is dealing with increasing pain in her back, for wisdom for the doctors, for wisdom for her, she and I, as we move forward, Lord. And Lord, I thank you for, for hearing our prayers that we can intercede for each other. I pray for the Antunes, for a healthy baby, for a healthy mother. And Lord, that is a cultural, at SCAD, uh, that is a center point of culture. And uh, Lord, he, I, I pray that your presence will be magnified in the lives of SCAD students. Uh, that, uh, that is a target, dear Lord, for the world right there. Guide the Antunes as they flesh out your gospel. Be with them. Speak to them, Lord. And I pray for these students that as they struggle in this world, Lord. And Father, I do, 
I do thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. And Father, I make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue in worship with him 485. Let's stand for 485, Like a River Glorious. Turn with me to Mark, Mark chapter 10, Mark 10, 32. At this point in Mark, the transfiguration of Jesus has, it's just taken place on the mountain. Peter, James, and John are there. They see this in the previous chapter. They, they see the glory of God that, that breaks through the veil of Jesus' humanity. And then it is at that same point uh, that Jesus then sets his face like flint towards Jerusalem, toward the Passover and uh, the feast, uh, Last Supper and the cross. So here there's a crowd that begins to follow Jesus forward now toward Jerusalem, but uh, the 12 disciples that are with Jesus, they see something that sort of startles them. Something about Jesus now makes them afraid to follow Jesus. Mark 10, 32. Now, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. Then he took the twelve aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, 
We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? Then they said to him, Grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said to him, We are able. So Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink. And with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Amen. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, we see your plan and purpose perfectly laid in Jesus Christ. Help us not to be afraid to follow him. Amen. Well, you can't get the right answer if you don't ask the right question. Uh, Good questions, they they bring good answers, but whatever question you ask, it is your question that's going to reveal your heart to everyone else. Your questions will expose you. I remember being uh, my first day in class in seminary, and I showed up there with a boatload. I had a ton of questions, and surely my professor would be proud of me. And I, I began to ask all these questions kept raising my hand and it became painfully clear to the professor and everyone else in the class that my questions had absolutely nothing to do with what the teacher was teaching on the board. Uh, You know, the professors, now they'll let you get away with a couple of uh, hillbilly questions, but there's a tipping point where whatever you ask has to line up with what he's teaching. And so finally, he literally shut me down. Uh, because apparently there was some, some confusion about what it meant to be in his classroom, listening to his lectures and absorbing uh, his purpose for the class. So I had to ditch my old questions and get new ones related to what he was teaching. That's Mark chapter 10. This is Mark 10. Jesus is having this same problem with his students, and they're, they're asking questions, but these aren't just unrelated questions. Uh, the questions they're asking are the opposite of his whole teaching. Now, for, for three years, uh, they've been in Jesus' traveling classroom, but apparently they've, they've missed a few classes, and here they are, verse 32. Jesus is now leading them in this final class. They're going to Jerusalem and to this pinnacle of ministry where Jesus himself is going to be taking his own final exam, Jesus' own final exam in Jerusalem. Now we know that teachers are not qualified simply by the exams that they give to others. They are qualified by the exams that they themselves must pass. Verse 33, this is the exam for Jesus. The Son of Man will be betrayed. 
He'll be condemned and then delivered to the Gentiles who will then, they will mock him, scourge him, spit on him, kill him, and then he will rise up the third day. This has eluded the disciples, and it's clear by what's going on here and their questions. They've simply been clinging silently to their old hopes. They've been clinging to their old dreams. And all of the questions relating to their old lives, everything they brought with them into class since the day that Jesus called them out of the crowd as their master. We forget that word sometime, master. So since the day that Jesus signed them up to class, he's been replacing old questions about old life with these new questions about new life and their own personal tests, their own tests of the disciples, they're about to take some exams. They haven't even cracked the book to begin to study for this. If you open it up, page one, it would sort of say something like this. Page one, the shepherd will be struck. Page two, the sheep will be scattered. You're gonna fail. So Jesus is forewarning them about this. And he's sort of telling them, this is going to be an open book exam. Even now, even right now, you can open your books. You can then really, you can copy off of each other's papers right now because you're soon going to be working in groups in order to relearn what you're actually failing right now. (laughs) Verse 43, the failure in the lesson. Verse 43, whoever desires to be great among you shall be a servant. Okay. Whoever desires to be first among you shall be a slave. Servants and slaves serving each other. Now he's been teaching this. Jesus has been living this. But the the questions they're asking are not matching up with what he's been teaching. The test of a teacher, the test of a real teacher and a servant is not simply from the top down but a, 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 the test, really, of, of a servant and a leader that's a servant is from the bottom up. It's from serving other people without overlording, he tells them, like all of the, the pagan kings that like to wield authority and power. Now, this does not mean that there is no God-ordained authority that is over us, over people. Uh, we know from the, the fifth commandment that Honor your father and mother, and then our catechisms, there are people over us, and there are people next to us and those that are beneath us. There is a chain and there is authority. Uh, The obvious, parents are over children, and their questions will show they're confused about that at times. Husbands are over the wives, ruling elders over deacons and over the church and Christ over the church. The, there's civil government and there's police, but then God is ruling over all. So there is an authority, but the authority that Jesus is speaking of here is a servanthood authority in leadership. So um, God doesn't just rule over us, even God himself. He's, he's ruler, but what kind of a ruler is he? He is a servant ruler. God sustains us. God feeds us. The Lord, he defends us. He he loves us. He labors for us sacrificially even to the cross. The opposite of this would be an armchair warrior. The armchair warrior doesn't do this. The armchair warrior, they are detached from people that they rule over. The mark of an armchair warrior, they send others into battle. They are without compassion. They have no empathy. They don't have mercy. And they're always sacrificing the others uh, that they rule. There's, a, there's an epic poem. If you've never read this epic poem, uh, there's an epic poem that records a real event. It's called the Charge of the Light Brigade. Charge of the Light Brigade. Famous poem over something that really happened. This poem was written uh, around 1854. It's in the Crimean War that's uh, English. uh, The English and the Russians are are fighting. And there's an English cavalry commander and the English cavalry brigade that's beneath him. He doesn't go into battle with them. But the captain then begins to send them on horses with swords to go attack cannons. 
You cannot attack cannons with a horse and a sword. They do it. The captain then sends them anyway. In the poem, simply, it retells this story. It's a into the valley of death rode the 600, the 600 on the horses. Into the valley of death rode the 600, half a league, half a league, half a league on. You see the bombs are blowing around and killing them. Into the valley of death rode the 600 who then died pointlessly. That's not our God. God himself is with us. He is not an armchair warrior. He has entered into our suffering in Jesus Christ. God himself is with us in his serving, in our serving. Uh, He doesn't just send us alone. He is with us. It's never pointless. It's never without a crown. He gives us crowns in the battles that we can then turn around and put back at his feet. We receive his reward in his service uh, so that our service is not in vain because it's attached to his glory. We serve a God, but he's not an armchair warrior. Now, Mark 10, this is the problem because the disciples are not asking questions about how to live sacrificial lives in Jesus. They're asking for safety. They're asking for prosperity. And actually here, they're asking for elevation. Verse 35, and wouldn't you know, this is Jesus' two youngest disciples. These are, these are greenhorns. These are the young guys, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Now you study them a little and you know that one day they're, they're going to grow up and they're going to graduate with real diplomas and servanthood to God, service to him. Uh, one day these guys are going to be called the sons of thunder. They're going to get it right one day. But right now, the sons of thunder don't have enough sense to get in out of the rain. <laughs> Verse 35. So here comes James and John, and they ask a really bad question. They're saying, Jesus, we have a question to ask you, but before we even ask you the question, we want you to give us a promise first. You can sort of see Jesus maybe turn around and sort of stare at them, maybe blinking at him at them. Verse 35. Lord, before we tell you what we want, promise us that you'll give us whatever it is that we're going to ask you. And surely the master is not going to see the hook in that bait before he responds. Um, It's been said that a, a, a a mouse only gets caught in a trap. The mouse only gets caught in a trap only because the mouse does not understand why the cheese is there. That's it. So Jesus here, you would sort of see him maybe look up. And we know from Matthew 20, 20, that Matthew 20, 20 is the the mirror here. Um, He looks up and past these two young disciples, who should we see that is with them? It is their mother. It is Mama Zebedee that is with them. And she's standing with her children, both of these guys. Now, Matthew 20, 20, Mama Zebedee with her two sons, James and John, and she has sort of sent them along with this apple to the teacher. And Mama Zebedee loves Jesus, but Mama Zebedee is still James and John's mama. Mamas have a way about wanting the best for their their boys. Verse 37, they ask, Lord, grant us to sit, one on your right hand and one on your left hand, and glory. You can see Mama Zebedee back there just quietly smiling and silently. Now they're sort of saying, Jesus, we don't want to be above you. We don't want to be above you, Jesus. You're the master. But we want to be beside you in glory. That means we, we really want to be above all the angels next to you. That means we want to be above all the other Christians next to you. We want to be above them. And we want to especially be above all of these older ten guys that are with us, these other disciples. We'd like to be above them as well. Man, they have failed the test before the exam in Jerusalem even gets started. 
<laughs> They've already blown it before they open the test book. Now, God has a way of sort of giving us these little pop tests to see if we're really paying attention. So there's sort of a word of warning here. There's a caution. There's a word of warning. Whenever you ask Jesus a question and then he asks you a question that's different with his own question, you are going to get an answer more than you asked for. <laughs> so, so what are they missing? They've been, they've been taught this every day and they're missing it. John chapter 6. You have to bounce between the Gospels to get the whole message. John 6, 38, Jesus has been telling them, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will here. I'm not just down here as an independent player, but for the will of the one who sent me. It's a direct reflection of the will of God in me. I am God and I'm doing exactly what the Father has asked. I've come down as a servant to my Father. I have forsaken my own will independently in that sense. Uh, Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man did not come to be served here, but in order to serve others as a ransom for many. Jesus came as a servant. Now, the servanthood of Jesus is not simply an end in of itself. God does not simply serve men. Jesus, as a man, served God by serving us in the capacity of a man in order to secure God's glory in us by the cross. Mankind is not the whole point of his suffering. God's glory is the point of Jesus' suffering and of all our suffering as well. Now, those who serve others are called servants. Those who do not own their own lives are called slaves. He's been teaching both of these words. This is the purpose not only of Jesus' own life, but it's the purpose for the life of everyone inside of his kingdom. Now, the word servant here, it's the word diakonos. This is the word deacon. So the word for deacon, it's describing this, this ministry of servanthood. Uh, it's, it's the universal sense here. Uh, everyone around us, we are serving always others. This is not just the office of the deacon, which belongs to men alone. The Bible is uh, very clear about elders and deacons. These offices belong to men alone. But here, this is the servanthood of all believers that Jesus himself is laying down into place at, at this point. We don't, we don't really mind that. Uh, the other word he uses is doulos. Doulos, he says, this is the word for slave. And it means exactly what it says. Now, one of the tragedies we have in the modern day is that biblical words have been destroyed very much so that we can't use them because of all the things that are going on in the world around us. Don't bend to that. Use the word. See what Jesus means. This is God's word. It has a biblical meaning. Now, dare we even fly a flag outside that has the rainbow on it? We lost that, did we? There are those that fly a rainbow flag, and it doesn't mean what God means with it. It could be their mercy. It could be their justification and salvation. But the way they're using the rainbow flag, it is their condemnation because of how they're using it. Now, deacons, we don't mind. We don't mind being called a deacon. That was my dad's nickname when CBs used to roam the land, and his name was Deacon on the CB. Deacon, we don't mind because there's honor in that. There's a respect. You serve other people, there's, a, there's some praise that you get. Uh, the other word is doulos, and we despise this. It's the word slave because it means that our life is not our own. It, it forfeits the purpose of my life. It, for, it forfeits the will of my life. It forfeits my life to someone else. How an American... Now, in Mark chapter 8, this has already happened again a couple of chapters before. You see it keeps happening. Mark 8, 32 has just taken place, and this is where Peter has openly rebuked Jesus because Jesus says 
He is both a slave and a servant to God's will. And he says, I'm going to the cross to lay down my life. Peter rebukes him for that. And Jesus, of course, turns around and rebukes Peter. The very famous phrase against Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of man. Peter, did you not read the syllabus for the class? Whoever desires to save his life, own his life, be his own master, you're going to lose that. Whoever loses his life for, here, my sake and the gospel, you will be saved by serving me, doing my will. This tells that the, the, the basic reality of a, of a satanic power is very simply this. Our first mother and father did it. It is the simple, ask, uh, simple task uh, of serving yourself in place of serving God. It's that simple to be satanic. Now the test of discipleship, it's not just dying once for being a disciple. It's the daily sacrifice to Christ. How did our Lord show us this? That comes out of Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2, Jesus is uh, describing Jesus. All of, the, all of the fullness of the Godhead dwelled in Jesus bodily. So there's no mistake, it's God in the body. And then Philippians 2, making himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant. That is the word doulos, that is the word slave. In the likeness of men humbling himself to obedience, even to the point of obedience on the cross. It means this, God the Son, the Son of God in this eternal glory, in agreement with the Father and the Spirit, he throws off his robes of glory in heaven, temporarily cloaking himself into what we call it temporary subordination. There's a temporary moment where Jesus is cloaking himself for a time, temporary subordination, uh, taking this lower form, putting on the robes of a servant and cloaking himself in the form, in the duty, in the service, and in the humility of a slave. Now, that class, and you'll call it a class, that class was the prerequisite class for Jesus to then qualify to take this final exam in Jerusalem. And he did it this way. The Bible describes how he became that servant. Uh, it describes it by his learning, by his suffering, and then obedience in the classes that we failed. Luke chapter 2, 52, it says something sort of unusual to the ear. It says, Jesus increased in wisdom. Jesus increased in wisdom and in favor with God and men. You then flip over to uh, Hebrews 5, 8, and it says, even though he was a son, God, God the Son, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered, uh, having become perfected. Now, this doesn't mean that he's improving himself in that sense like we would think, but it's simply stating this, that by passing every test that we failed all along the way, by passing every test, but specifically this test of servanthood, specifically that test, that apart from Jesus qualifying himself, he could not have qualified us, and if he hadn't done it, he could issue no test, and we would have no place inside of God's classroom. 1 Corinthians 6.19, 1 Corinthians 6.19 nails it. It says, do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you and that you are not your own? And it uses the same word. You are slaves, you are slaves, whom Jesus has purchased with a price. We are sons of God, but because he bought us. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which belong to God. Romans 6, 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, it says, you are that one's slaves whom you obey. When you obey something, 
You become its slave, it is your master. And it goes on, it says, you're either slaves of sin, you're slaves of sin leading to death, or you are slaves of obedience leading to righteousness. Either side, whatever you serve becomes your master, it owns you, everyone has a master. The question is, what kind of a master do you have? Who is your master? What's he like? If you claim to have no master, you are declaring that you are on your way to hell. If you claimed to be your own God, then you you would claim to have no master. That means you're going to stand before God in your own sins and uh, that you'll end as a slave of unrighteousness and death and hell eternally. Examine your service. Examine your service. Because what you serve will show your master, and it will show where you are going, because a servant always follows his master. Mark 10, after three years on the road with Jesus teaching them this, uh, they're still clogging the classroom with these, with these old questions. And now, verse 32, suddenly Jesus turns. Verse 32, suddenly Jesus, he, he sets his face like flint towards Jerusalem. Now this is for the Passover. He, he's done this with them every year for the past three years. But now there's something different about Jesus. And as they look at their master, verse 32, as they look probably at his face or his countenance or something, it says they become amazed and suddenly they are afraid to follow Jesus. Afraid. Now Mark uses both these words. He says they're amazed and they're Afraid, They see this obsession in Jesus. Jesus is now obsessed about his own death. So the word here for amazed, it means startled. Didn't catch that. And the word afraid is the word phobos. It means phobia. It's terrified. They're startled and they're terrified. Verse 32, Jesus unleashes it. He says, today is the day we are going to Jerusalem where I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be betrayed and I'm going to be killed. The implication, whatever happens to the master is going to happen to the student. That's what they're afraid of. The fear is not about Jesus. The fear is the cost it's going to cost them to follow Jesus all the way to the cross. They're afraid about their own lives. They're afraid of what it's going to cost. There's a, there's a hidden cost now they didn't really see in this following Jesus. Discipleship has a cost. When God asks you, what do you want me to do for you? And when we we give him this request, we ask things of him, telling him what we desire. But the balance of what we ask, we didn't see it, but it's got a hidden cost that keeps unfolding far beyond what we have requested. When someone says, will you marry me? It's not just the word yes. That yes has to keep unfolding. The answer to that yes keeps unfolding inside of that marriage. The yes keeps unfolding in ways you, you never dreamed of. That answer keeps unfolding. It's the same way with asking to get into a university. I, I want to get into that university. You want acceptance to the university. The, you get admission to a college. Uh, we're happy to get into the class, but the hidden cost is now everyone else is going to have to grade our papers and someone else is going to judge me over everything I do. It's a hidden cost. Now, ironically, briefly, verse 37, when James and John, they ask to sit on the left and the right hand of Jesus, it sounds really bad, but in truth, this is a statement of faith. This is a real faith. This is a faith. They've just seen the the transfiguration, remember? They've just seen this on the mountain. Mark 9, they've seen the the glory of God bursting through the clothing of of Jesus. There's Moses and Elijah. Man, their faith explodes through the roof. But that faith is an immature faith. They are greenhorns, and that faith has not been tested. Verse 38, Jesus tests their faith. 
He says, do you understand what you're asking? Do you know the hidden cost of what you're asking? Verse 38, <laughs> are you able to drink the cup I'm about to drink? Are you gonna, you're going to be baptized with my baptism? Can you survive my baptism? Take care with what you ask Jesus because it has a hidden cost. Now, Hendrickson makes a quick comment here in his commentary. And he says that um, to, to drink the cup, Jesus is speaking of his active obedience. You, you do something fully, you perfect it. And when he speaks of this baptism here, he's speaking of passive obedience. And that's the willingness to receive suffering upon himself. So to drink the cup, this is a Hebrew way of saying you have to swallow the full measure of something so it's the cup of God's wrath that is waiting for Jesus in Jerusalem. Verse 39, the sons of Zebedee answer foolishly, we are able, we're able to drink it. Once again, you could sort of see Jesus bow his head, then maybe looking up again, but looking past them, He's looking up to Jerusalem around the corner. He's looking at the Passover, the, the setter meal that he's going to have with them. And he's looking at the Last Supper, the place where he's going to wash their feet. They do not understand. And he answers, Oh, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink. It's not going to just be a communion cup. It's going to be your obedience. And with the baptism that I am baptized with, you will be baptized. Most of them are going to be killed for Christ. They're all going to suffer for the kingdom. But to sit on my left and right hand, no matter how much suffering you do, someone else has already been awarded to. Do you understand what you're asking? When you seek elevation, you're forgetting this. That a request for glory is the request for suffering. Luke 24, he's going to tell them later, O oh, foolish ones, slow to believe. First comes the suffering, then comes the glory. It's the cross that can lead us home only. No cross, no suffering, no crown, and no glory. And then lastly, he takes the disciples back to the chalkboard. Now, Mark has put two layers here. He's put one scene, and right below it, he puts another scene in Mark 10, 46. This is the cure. This is the chalkboard. Mark 10, 46. They begin passing through Jericho. They get the other side of Jericho. The disciples are with them. And look, behold, there's blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus, he's sitting there beside the road. Poor old blind Bartimaeus. A blind man living in squalor. Blind Bartimaeus, who, who has to depend on others to serve him. He's not able to see the food stain that's on his clothes. He's not able to avoid stumbling over little stones and roots that he can't see, having to beg others for food and for mercy. Verse 47, Bartimaeus, hearing Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, he begins crying out with a request. What is the request? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. They, they try to shut him down and he gets louder. But now Jesus is now hearing the right question. The right question that's being asked. And he looks at the disciples and he says, go bring the blind man to me. Bring this blind man to me. Verse 49, Jesus stood still and commanded him uh, to be called. So Bartimaeus throws off his garment. He stands up and they, they bring him to Jesus. And now verse 51, this is another place where the disciples are going to be taught in front of a crowd what they missed. Jesus then asks Bartimaeus the same question that the disciples failed to answer rightly earlier that day. Bartimaeus, verse 51, what do you want me to do for you? Bartimaeus asked, teacher, that I may receive my sight. 
want to see again. I want to see. I, I want to see the one who's going to heal me. I, I want to see the kingdom of God. The real question is, does Bartimaeus even understand what he is asking? Does he understand there's going to be a hidden cost in what Bartimaeus is asking? There's going to be a hidden cost unfolding Bartimaeus' whole life. If Jesus heals you, Bartimaeus, if, are you sure you want Jesus to heal you? Do you understand what will happen when he opens your eyes? Man, your eyes are going to be open to things that you've never seen before. You're going to see all the filth that you've been sitting in as a blind man. You're going to see the filthy stains on your clothes. Uh, people laughed at you. If Jesus restores your sight, no one is going to pity you anymore. No one's going to bring you water. No one is going to do your shopping for you anymore. No one's going to give you free things. You will have to get a job. You'll have to learn how to be responsible now. You're going to have to learn how to get along with people now. You're going to have to be sort of an adult. You'll have to cook your own food now. And you'll have to look out where you're going because all the little things you used to trip over as a blind man, you can see them now. Now it's your fault if you fall over. And instead of being a charity case, you'll have to labor and you're going to have to serve others with everything that you earn. And you're going to have to give charity even to the enemies who used to make fun of you when you were a blind man. Are you sure you want to be healed? Have you asked the right question? If I open your eyes, Bartimaeus, it's going to be, you're going to see me all right, but you're going to see me only for a moment. You're going to see the one who heals you taken to a cross and punished for your sins. Have we asked the right question of God? Having asked Jesus the right question, Jesus then gives him the right answer and see what happens. Go your way. Your faith has made you well. What is Bartimaeus' way? Is he afraid to follow Jesus? And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. He's not afraid to follow. That's the question. Do you understand what Jesus is asking? The real question is, am I, am I willing to receive the whole answer? What, what do you want Jesus to do for you? What are you asking? There's a hidden cost in it. Are you willing to receive the whole answer? Let's bow. Heavenly Father, thank you that you, you hear our requests and even our foolish questions. Lord, you are patient with us. But Lord, we don't want to be afraid to follow you. Oh Lord, help us to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is our insert, and it's a prayer to God that he would open our eyes. Let's stand to sing.
benediction from his word. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Jesus alone to all generations forever. Amen. I realized that last night, Clark, and thanks to that, you know, we don't really realize that some of, we always read these little things. 